Hello everybody. I'm back a day later than promised. I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, I lost completely lost track of time. As sometimes happens in lockdown. How are you all getting on? Is lockdown treating you well? Are you going a bit crazy? I feel like I'm going a bit crazy and I know my children are becoming more and more feral every day. Uh, you'll probably hear them at some point today having a tantrum. Um, I've had a couple of tantrums too. I guess it just comes with the territory. But we're getting through it a day at a time. It is difficult. It's difficult when you can't do the things that you normally do, the things that you take for granted. Just like going into town and, you know, going to the library and going out for pizza and things like that. And just not even seeing your family and friends. It feels quite isolating and difficult. But we have technology and we have each other. And... This is the whole point of this as well, is it's for me to say, you know, you're not on your own. I'm here too. I'm reading you my book. We're reading this together. And uh, it's really nice to be able to do it. And I'm glad that some of you are still here. We are now on a death sentence. There's Alex there looking quite beastly and cool. Um, yeah, so very quick summary. Alex was uh, accused of murdering his best friend Toby and sent to Furnace Penitentiary. Furnace Penitentiary is the world's worst prison, buried a mile beneath the ground. Once you're there, you're there until you die. And that doesn't take very long because this prison is full of some very nasty things. Alex in prison met uh, a, a guy called Donovan. That was his cellmate. He also arrived at the same time as a guy called Z. Z uh, was, uh, became his friend very, very quickly. And Al um, Al 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 too quickly, Alex, Donovan and Z. Uh, together with uh, a few other inmates, hatched a plan to escape from Furnace and they blew a hole in one of the rooms inside Furnace using gas from the kitchens. Alex, Z and um, Gary, his name was, uh, one of the bullies and another kid called Toby jumped into the river beneath the prison. Donovan sadly got taken by the warden the day before they were about to escape. Alex thought they were free, but they just got kind of beaten up by the river and then deposited in the tunnels beneath Furnace, where they were swiftly recaptured by the warden, warden and thrown in solitary confinement, which is basically a hole beneath the ground. Gary was taken to the infirmary to be experimented on. Toby died, we assume. So Z and Alex are in prison, and one day they get pulled out of their cells by this strange kind of twisted figure called Simon. Simon heard about the escape up top in general population in the prison, and he wanted Alex and Z to help them escape him and a few others to escape the tunnels beneath Furnace, because inside the tunnels beneath Furnace, there is a war going on between the warden and his henchmen, and some of the creatures that they've created these things called rats which are furious and feral and basically will try and kill anything so Alex and Simon and Z work out that they can escape by climbing up a steeple inside one of the caverns beneath the prison and they make a plan to do it they also find Donovan Donovan inside the prison infirmary as well he is basically all the way turned into a black suit. Uh, he has silver eyes, his muscles have grotesque, grotesquely enlarged, he's been cut apart. More importantly, more devastatingly, he's lost his mind. He kind of half recognises Alex, but he doesn't really know who he is anymore. Alex and Simon uh, decide to climb the steeple. Z gets taken by the warden and taken into the infirmary. So Alex and Simon try and climb the steeple. They can't get up to the top though because there is a nest of rats in the way and they can't get past it. So devastated, they climb back down and then Alex realises that there is another way out of the prison. And that way is to climb the chimney that leads from the incinerator to the surface. So they, they run back in to the infirmary. They grab Z. Alex, probably the most horrible part of the books he realizes that there is no hope of saving Donovan and he doesn't want him to lose himself he doesn't want his friend um to become something that he would have hated so he takes a pillow and he smothers Donovan and kills him and that's it and poor Donovan I'm just yeah so it's heartbreaking and Alex and Z and Simon cl start climbing the incinerator tunnel purely by chance the incinerator is switched on though and they quickly fall back down because of the smoke and they fall back down to find the warden and some black suits and some wheezers waiting for them at the bottom and that is where solitary ends and this is where death sentence starts <clears throat> dead good first chapter eh? dead i died in that room 
I died there among the corpses in the darkness at the bottom of the world. I died with the fires of the incinerator still burning on my flesh, like the devil himself had his fingers in me. I died with the warden's howls of laughter ringing in my ears. But it (coughs) wasn't a merciful death. My heart didn't stop beating. My lungs didn't stop clawing at the hot air. The white-hot pain didn't leave my muscles, my skin, my bones, and I didn't drift into oblivion the way I'd always dreamed death would be. No, I was in furnace penitentiary, and here even death doesn't dare show its face. The Grim Reaper had abandoned me like everyone else, leaving me alone with my nightmares. They say your life flashes before your eyes when you die. Well, that's only half true. You don't see the happy times, the laughter. You only see your failures. Lying there with the thunder of the black suits raging above my head and the smell of burning flesh in my throat, I saw the endless mistakes of my life laid bare. I saw my crimes the night my old friend Toby and I had broken into our last house. I saw the black suits, Moleface pulling the trigger that reduced Toby to a stain on the carpet. I saw my trial for his murder, the way the world turned against me with the crash of a gavel. I saw my first day in furnace, buried forever beneath the ground. I pictured Donovan and Z, our plan to escape. I saw us smuggling gas-filled gloves from the kitchen into the chipping room and blowing out the floor. I saw our punishment for trying to escape, trapped in the guts of the prison with the rats hungry for our blood and the lightless coffin of solitary confinement. I was forced to relive the horror of what they'd done to Donovan, stripped him of everything human, packed with muscle and gristle and something bad that dripped darkness into his veins. Then the horror of what I had done to him, pressing a pillow to his face until he was no longer a monster, until he was no longer anything. I saw it all, the worst bits of my life paraded in front of me by my own stuttering heartbeat. I tried to remember something good, something hopeful. I mean, we'd almost made it after that. Me and Z and the kid called Simon, we'd almost climbed our way to freedom up the incinerator chimney. I still had that splinter of daylight in my mind. I had seen the sun and it had seen me. And maybe that was enough. Maybe I could die now knowing I'd broken furnace, knowing that I had breathed fresh air once again. Except the death furnace had in store for me wasn't a genuine one. The black suits had lit the incinerator when we were halfway up and they had pulled us from the flames with the hunger in their eyes and I knew what was coming. My, my, look what the rats dragged in. Get them into surgery. Prep the wheezers. We can still use them. The echo of the warden's voice. One of the last things I would ever hear because I died in that room. Like all the other lost boys of Furnace, I would soon be reborn. But I wouldn't be me. I would become a black suit, my heart as dark as my jacket. Or I'd become a rat, trapped in the tunnels of the prison and feasting on those I had once called friends. But even, even as I felt myself dragged off to the infirmary, I swore that it wasn't over. Just don't forget your name, Monty had told me. I wouldn't. I died in that room. I would be reborn as something else, something terrible. But I was Alex Sawyer, and I would have my revenge. The Ivy. Welcome Welcome back, old friend. I thought I heard the tunnel walls laughing as I was carried through them. Deep chuckles that could have been distant earthquakes. Somewhere inside I knew it must have been the echo of the black suits, but the injuries in my mind were just as bad as the ones on my skin, and reality was a distant memory. I was living inside a nightmare now, a place where Furnace was a creature that howled with delight as we were pulled back into its belly, dragged to the infirmary. Every atom of my being was in agony. God knows how badly I'd been burned when I hit the incinerator flames. I would have opened my eyes to see if I'd been barbecued, but they wouldn't obey. I would have lifted a hand to check that I still had my eyes, but I couldn't find the strength. I would have screamed, but there was barely enough air in my smoke-ravaged lungs to breathe. Instead, I tried to shut down my brain, tried to forget that I'd ever been alive, tried to flood my body with absence, a black tide that would douse the pain in my flesh. 
Maybe if I could do that, then death would sneak in, snatch me up right from under their noses. It worked for the fraction of a second until I heard the voice. Oh no, you don't, Alex! The warden hissed, snapping me back into my body. Death can't have what belongs to me. The whisper grew louder, accompanied by wicked shrieks I knew all too well. Get those wheezers to work. We haven't got long. And find me an IV. Now. I was lowered onto something that should have been soft, but which felt like acid against my burnt skin. I tried once more to leave my head. Maybe if I could just escape my skull for an instant, then death would take me. Carry me up through the rock towards that silver, sorry, sliver of daylight I had glimpsed only minutes ago. Then I felt the needle in my arm, and something cold rushed into my veins. I knew exactly what it was. I'd seen it before on Gary, on Donovan. A drip full of evil, not quite black, not quite silver with specks of starlight floating in its dark weight. It was the warden's poison, the stuff that turned you into a monster. I tried to fight it, to buck my body until the needle came out. But the pain was too great, and I could feel the leather straps holding me tight against the infirmary bed. The panic grew like a living thing in my chest, and I made one last mental effort to escape, to leave my flesh behind and vanish like smoke. But the liquid nightmare flowed into me like molten lead, filling my veins and arteries and weighing me down. And it's impossible to escape anything when the chains are inside you. It was only a matter of seconds before it reached my brain. To my surprise, it numbed the agony. I felt the same way I had years ago, a lifetime ago, when I'd broken my wrist and the doctors had given me morphine. It was like I was no longer connected to anything physical, like my mind was free. I should have known better than to hope. For a blissful instant, I felt nothing. Then the floodgates opened and something far worse than physical pain burst into my head. This time, I managed to scream. It was as if the warden had ridden into my mind on the wave of poison, because I could swear his voice came from inside my skull. It's over, he said, the sound of him causing rotten images to sprout from the shadows in my head. I saw something that looked like flybone blown meat, something else that could have been a dead dog, there for only a second before evaporating. The warden continued, Everything you ever were, everything you are now, and everything you ever wanted to be, it's over. I wanted to argue. I wanted to open my mouth and tell him he was wrong, but his words were like maggots burrowing him to the flesh of my brain. They gorged and grew fat on his dry laughter, revealing visions so horrific that I couldn't bear to make sense of them. There is nothing to be gained in fighting. What flows inside you now is far more powerful than that fallacy you call a soul. Let it take you, for without it you are nothing. I am something. I am Alex, I tried to say. But even inside my own head, his voice was stronger than mine. You are nothing. You can be nothing. Surrender yourself and be done. You were never Alex Sawyer, because Alex Sawyer never existed. You're wrong. I'm... I began. But my words were so weak I could barely hear them. He cut me off with another laugh, and this time, when he spoke, his voice was like fingers sliding into my brain. Alex Sawyer never existed. You are one of us. <coughs> the fingers flexed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's me trying to do the warden's voice. <coughs> the fingers flexed, as if they were pulling something out of me, and with nothing more than a whimper, I fell into the gaping emptiness that had once been my soul. <coughs> ah. I was standing in a muddy trench, and for a moment I thought I was free. Then I glanced up at the sky and saw an endless void of darkness, and I knew that I was dreaming. To my left and right were slick earth walls the colour of blood, sheer and too high to climb. Not that I'd have wanted to. Beyond I could make out dull explosions that shook the air and caused a fine rain of soil. I was about to take my eyes from the sides of the trench when I noticed a vague shake, shape in the mud. I couldn't quite make out what it was until two slits appeared and a pair of eyes stared back at me.
By the time a mouth had opened up beneath those eyes and unleashed a groan of desperation, I was already running. The ground gripped my feet the way it always does in dreams, slowing my escape. And when I looked down, it was hands I saw pushing from the mud, cracked and broken fingers snatching at my legs. I kicked out at them, trying not to lose my balance, trying not to fall. But there were simply too many. Dozens of hands and faces emerging from the soil like the living dead. I felt the world spin. Saw the ground rush up to meet me. There was no impact. Before I could land, the trench seemed to freeze, all except for a puddle of filth right beneath my face. The muddy water bulged up, then slowly parted to reveal a face beneath, caked in dirt, but still familiar. What do you want? I asked it, although my voice made no sound. The mouth opened and moved as though it was speaking, but again I could hear nothing. Who are you? I asked wordlessly, studying the eyes, the nose, trying to remember where I'd seen the face before. It didn't stop talking, but there may as well have been a sheet of soundproof glass between us. I focused on its lips, caked in mud, but visible. Don't, I made out, reading the way they moved. Forget. It could have been any of a million words, but somehow I knew, just like I knew what was coming next. Your name, the figure mimed. I opened my mouth to reply, but before I could do so, the face morphed into an expression of pure terror, its eyes like diamonds set into the wet earth. It was only then that I recognised myself in the mud, the face a mirror image of my own. It, I, tried to say something else, but my mirror face was sucked back into the ground, mud filling its mouth and nose, flowing over its still open eyes until nothing remained. Wait! I yelled. Wait! Then the rest of the trench once again found life, zombie hands grabbing my legs and clothes and head and pulling me down into the grave. My heart lurched, the sensation of being buried alive too terrifying for my sleeping mind. The trench exploded into dust, darkness flooding in like water and propelling me back to the surface. I rose from the dream like a drowning man, gasping for air and clutching at the night. It didn't take long for me to remember that the real world was even more horrific than my nightmare. But far worse was the fact that, for several seconds after waking, I couldn't remember who I was. I'll do one more chapter because while I was speaking there, my wife, who was a ninja, dropped off a, a mug of tea. Thank you, Becky. Tea, tea on demand is amazing. It's the best. Okay. The next chapter is called Under the Knife. Even though I was still blind, I knew the warden was watching me. I squirmed like an ant trying to escape a lit match, but the bed held me tight in its leather grip, and in his only reaction was another hateful laugh. Did you dream? he asked, his voice at once distant and whispered in my ear. Part of me was glad that I couldn't see. It meant I didn't have to look at his eyes, or the place where his eyes should have been if anyone had been able to meet them. Everybody dreams the first few times. I opened my mouth, hoping that some words would tumble out, but it was so dry that my defiance lodged in my throat. Dreams of dark places, the warden went on. I could hear the tap of his shoes as he moved around my bed, right to left. Behind that was another sound, a heart monitor matching my own weak pulse, beep for beat. I remembered the machines I'd seen by the beds in the infirmary. I knew that's where I was now, just another test subject for Furnace's bad science. The thought should have terrified me, but the poison in my veins imprisoned my emotions the same way the straps gripped my body. Again, I tried to speak, spitting out a dry husk of a word that even I couldn't have interpreted. But the warden seemed to know exactly what I meant. Z, yes, he is here, and that freak who let you out of your cage. But they, like you, are about to pass from this fitful existence into something far more meaningful. Tell me, the bed creaked as the warden sat on the edge of the mattress. Tell me what you saw when you slept. 
Already the dream had drained from my mind, leaving nothing but a residue that sat in my gut like a cannonball. I remembered a trench, bodies buried in the mud, and my own twisted reflection sucked down into the grave. I kept my mouth shut, not wanting to give the warden the satisfaction of an answer, but again he seemed to scoop the thoughts right out of my head. The trench, he whispered, the glee in his voice like rancid honey. The fallen army, fascinating, but then I was expecting no less from you. The bed shifted, the rustle of the warden's suit as he once again continued pacing. That's twice now you almost escaped. Once. That was impressive. For the first time since I'd been caught, I heard an edge of anger in the warden's voice, and I pushed myself back into the bed to escape it. But I could sense his face right above mine, his foul breath on my skin. Twice! That was just rude! He spoke again, and I struggled for a moment to hear what he was saying until I realised it wasn't directed at me. A wheeze rattled across the room, and I felt the panic rise up even through the cloud of poison. The warden spoke a few more whispered words before his voice returned to me. Of course, it all seems to have worked out. I have you to thank for leading the vermin to us. We managed to cull quite a few of those rat bastards, and others have been rounded up. You'll see them again soon. A few of my men perished, and a few had to be put down. But we can always make more. He laughed, a childish snigger that made my charred skin crawl. Speaking of which, we should get started. The nectar will keep you alive for so long, but only the knife can save you. Another wheezed groan cut across the room, followed by one echo, then two. Against the black canvas of my blindness, I pictured the creature staggering towards me, gas masks stitched onto rotting faces, filthy needles strapped to their chests, and scalpels held out to my face. I fought against my restraints until I felt the leather cut my skin, until my muscles cramped, but I was powerless. Don't fight it, the warden said, his voice fading as though he was walking away. It is a new birth. Then something cold pressed itself against my mouth. Gas choked its way down my throat. And once again, I tumbled into oblivion. This time, there was no trench, just a bare room. Lined up facing one wall on their knees were six figures. Each had his hands cuffed behind his back and his forehead pressed against the chipped bricks. I couldn't see their faces, but... This being a dream, I knew what they looked like. All boys about my age, their expressions drawn from hunger and stained with tears. They were dressed in dirty cloth overalls that could have been furnace uniforms, except there were two numbers stenciled on the back of each. The same two numbers, 36. And beneath them, almost unrecognisable against the filth of the fabric, a symbol that sent chills down my spine, even in my sleep swastikas, the unmistakable insignia of the Nazis. Who are you? I asked them, but nothing escaped my mouth. I shouted the question once more, then screamed it, but the room's heavy silence remained undisturbed. There was no movement either, the scene as still as a photograph, until one of the boys started to move. It began as a tremor that made his overalls ripple like water. Then his head started to shake wildly from side to side, his body soon following until he was thrashing against the wall. Within seconds, another of the boys was suffering a similar fit, then a third until every one of the kids resembled a marionette being jerked by a lunatic puppeteer. Their convulsions became so violent that their hair was torn loose, their skin started to split, their heads smashed from side to side so quickly that I could no longer make out their faces, each a blur that painted the wall red. The boy who had first started fitting suddenly stopped, snapping his cuffs as though they were paper. He lurched to his feet and turned, and I saw a face that was right at home here in a nightmare. His skin hung off, of him, off him in strips, his jaw dislocated and drooping, and his silver eyes blazed into mine with undiluted hatred. 
rats. The other kids stopped spasming and wrenched their way free from their restraints, leaving bloody handprints on the wall as they stood. I found myself face to face with a line of vermin ready to tear me limb from limb. The fear that made me want to run was also the thing that kept me rooted to the spot, and I could do nothing but watch as they staggered towards me. Something exploded in my ear, and the noise so loud that my heart missed a beat. It came again, the blast of a shot, then again and again as bullets tore through the air and punched into the transformed boys. In a heartbeat, the room was full of smoke, and the kids were nothing but corpses. A voice replaced the gunshots, a language I didn't speak but a tone I could easily understand. I felt the sting of the hot gun barrel against my temple, and I closed my eyes, praying for silence once again so that I wouldn't hear the shot that killed me. When I woke, the sensation of being executed was almost real. The front of my face burned as it had when I was lying in the incinerator, a pressure in my eyes that felt like something was trying to crawl into my head. My arms were still locked tight, and there was nothing to stop the panic spewing up from my gut until I realised that instead of darkness, I was bathed in a halo of weak light. I snatched in a long breath. I tried to clamp down on the fear. I blinked, hoping that the fuzzy glow before me would focus into something recognisable. It didn't, remaining a featureless cloud of milky grey. I scrunched up my face, feeling something tied tight around my head, and I suddenly knew what had happened. When they took off my bandages, I would have eyes of cold silver. I wanted to cry, but the warden's poison, what had he called it, nectar, still lay heavy across my thoughts and stopped the emotions breaking free. Even so, the image of myself with the eyes of a black suit of a rat danced against a black drop of smoke and shadow, and it was all I could do not to scream. I'd rather be blind. It was the first thing they did that to, did to you. I knew that much. I thought back to when I'd gone into the infirmary and found Gary lying in a bed the same way I was now, bandages strapped to his face and dark stains spreading out from his eyes. Next, they would butcher my body, my face, stuffing me with muscles until I was big enough to fill one of their black suits. And by that time, the nectar would have done its job, destroying my brain just as the scalpels had destroyed my body, making me one of them. And all I could do was lie here and dream. Nightmares when I slept, nightmares when I woke. As if trying to distract me from my thoughts, a weak groan fluttered up over the beep of my heart monitor, hanging in the air for a second before dying. Someone else repeated it, closer this time, ending in a choked sob. I opened my mouth, flexed my jaw, took as deep a breath as the pain would let me. See, I whispered, a word as dry as my throat. I tried again, managed to hiss. Z. The only response I got was a wheezer's song, a tuneless squeal like a broken engine. There was a shuffle of boots on stone, the clink of needles as it walked my way. I blinked again, the pain a pressure that threatened to crack my skull. Being here was even worse than being locked in the darkness of the hole. At least I knew I was alone there. Z, I said, distress giving strength to my cry. Simon! Hush! The reply was so soft that I wondered if I'd imagined it. Only it came again, close enough to be from the next compartment. Alex, if, if that's you, you've got to stay quiet. They'll kill you if, you hear you, if they hear you talking. Z? I asked, quieter this time. The voice was too soft to place it, even with C's accent. Excuse me. There was no answer, only the clink of curtain rails as the screen by my bed was pulled aside. I heard the weezer right above me, that grotesque purr like it was gargling blood. For what seemed like an eternity, nothing happened. Then I felt a stabbing pain in my arm. Before I could even cry out, something rushed into my veins like cold smoke, the poison flushing every last thought from my mind. I called out again, yet this time... It was nothing but an echo in my head that pulled me back into the boundless night. Oh dear. Okay, so. I'll stop there. Even with my tea. And the next chapter is called Second Sight. 
I still have a cough, as you can probably tell. So the doctor thinks maybe it's not uh, an infection, or maybe it was a viral infection that's become a... It's just aggravated my asthma. So I told you I'm asthmatic. Um, it hasn't really bothered me since I was a kid, but recently it's kind of started kicking up again. <coughs> as you can tell. Uh, probably a bit of hay fever, probably a bit of something viral, and probably just being a bit old and fat. Uh, all these things contribute so um, I'm sorry about that I thought maybe we'd get through death sentence without coughing but sadly we couldn't even get past the first couple of chapters without coughing I hope you will join me tomorrow for another two or maybe three chapters this is so for me the whole series is one book that got divided into five books because in my head it was just one great big arc but I think this book might be my favourite, especially the second half of it. So I'm really eager to get there. So I might try and get through three chapters a day. Uh, it gets so exciting towards the end of this book. Um, <coughs> well, hopefully the whole book is exciting, but definitely towards the end. Um, have a really great day. It's the weekend again. It's uh, Saturday. Uh, well, certainly when I was recording this. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend. I hope lockdown is treating you well. I hope the weather is nice where you are. I hope you've got lovely things to do. I hope you've got lots of lovely people around you, or at least people you can access. Remember, if you're feeling a bit down, just pick up a phone and try and talk to somebody or get online and try and talk to somebody. Just remember that even if you are isolating on your own, you're not on your own. We're all here. And yeah, I will see you tomorrow. Okay, take care, everyone. And yeah. <laughs>